I think my, probably my first question is with regards to you arranging arranging and producing all those albums back in the day especially like Lift Him Up and God Is Able those are like my desert island discs should we say um, where did you get your inspiration for, for putting those arrangements together was it something that you just kind of heard or were you influenced by something else or um, you know all of that uh, uh, I mean, not not to, to sort of give a super spiritual answer. I mean, I, I oh, would no. want this to be I, I would want this to be really practical. But um, all of those albums, you know, it, it was kind of like a um, best way to describe it is like God is driving the train and the train is leaving the station, yeah. and we know we're supposed to be on the train. But I mean, literally week after week you know we're like sprinting to catch up with what god was doing so wow uh, you know like when i met ron uh you know it was at a church service it was just you know completely people on their face you know mm. over the top kind of just a spiritual personal spiritual experience yeah so i knew that was something that god wanted us to share mm. uh so you know i went back to my guys, Moen and, and the other couple of guys that were Integrity, and just said, and, and this kind of went on constantly, mm -hmm. but uh, with Ron in particular, just this is one of the guys that God wants us to work with. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got together with him, listened to a lot of songs together. Uh, I brought him in to meet those guys. Uh, you know, So we went through the songs that he and I had cherry-picked, you know, Don would bring some songs that he had heard recently, mm -hmm. the other two guys the same. So, um, but at that point, we were on a, a schedule where we were producing an album start to finish every eight weeks. Wow, that's unheard of. Um, just, yeah, the, the, uh, so the main business guys of Integrity actually had published a Christian magazine. Mm -hmm. that, that was their background. And it was one of these magazines, it, it, it kind of represented this group of six pastors mm -hmm. uh, and it had sort of run its course the, the pastors were kind of getting old and retiring so mm -hmm. um, it was you know, it just felt like it was time for that magazine to close down mm -hmm. and about three issues from the end they had heard um, so the magazine came out every eight weeks right yeah, yeah. so they, they had uh, they had heard a worship album that I'd done in my church and they said hey you know we got three issues left, uh, but we really love this album that you did. Would you mind if we put in an ad mm. and just offered your album <laughs> to our subscribers? So they mm. did, and they had a kind of an overwhelming response. Mm. And they thought, you know, eight weeks later, uh, it's like, well, do you have another one? And it's like, well, we have one more that we feel is worthy of that kind of recognition. So yeah. eight weeks later, they do the second one, huge response. So basically, it's last issue of the magazine, and they said, look, this is our last shot, really. We're going to close it all down. You know, do you have one more? Mm. And we said, well, those two are the ones we're really, you know, we feel good about. But mm. if it's eight weeks away, we'll just make a new one in our church. Mm. So we, we made a new one, which is uh, was All Hail King Jesus. Yeah. And basically, they just said, Tom... Here's the deal. We're getting ready to let 150 employees, mostly our church people, go. Uh, what would you think if you can really do a worship album every eight weeks, mm. which of course nobody <laughs> bothered to tell you it was impossible. Yeah. Uh, if you can do, if you could do a new one every eight weeks, we'll just ask our subscribers from the magazine if they'd be interested in instead of closing down, would they be interested in receiving a worship album mm. every eight weeks? And we'll do it on a basis where we'll ship it to them. And if you like it, you pay for it. If you don't, just send it back. Mm. And, you know, we were young and said, sure, why not? You know? <laughs> so we started doing these albums every eight weeks. And, uh, and they had a huge response from the magazine subscribers. So it, it kind of jumped off that way. But that's the only reason why we got on this eight-week schedule is because it was actually a magazine schedule. Okay, right. That makes sense. But literally, from the time I met Ron until we came out with that first album was literally eight weeks start to finish. Hmm. And just with, you know, I mean, they promised that ship date, so we could not miss. You know, you hmm. couldn't 
it's not like the record business where you say, hey, you know, we need another month or so to mix. It just, it had to go. So, so we got on that schedule of uh, uh, literally doing an album start to finish every eight weeks. Wow. I mean, we, we, we would back it up. So we would, uh, so in other words, like we'd meet a new worship leader. We, we basically met. They all came to my studio every eight weeks. Hmm. So in that one meeting, we would kind of, like I'd play my final mix of the album that was going to ship in a week. Mm-hmm. We would plan out the live remote of the next one. We would start going over songs for the one that's going to follow that, and then we'd probably meet a worship leader for the first time that would be the album after that. <laughs> wow! So you know, it, it was kind of stacked up that way. Yeah. But uh, okay. Yeah. So so when you came up with some of the arrangements, was was it a case, was it a case of you heard the song for the first time and then you, you, you just kind of heard what, what you imagined it to sound like or or did you get influence from other things? or? Well, yeah, I mean, so so the short answer to your first question was, yeah, I would come away with those songs mm. and, and just kind of based on, you know, my own kind of background, arranging and worship mm. experience at our church, would just sit down with God at the keyboard and just sort of imagine what this could be yeah and uh you know my my church upbringing was was really great so i had kind of a uh uh, parallel pop and classical background training Mm -hmm. and a lot of the same uh, this is in st louis missouri which is kind of the midwest Mm -hmm. and my professor in college was the choral conductor of the st louis symphony and a lot of those players were professors in the university so I ended up being like the student conductor of the symphony. So I was constantly wow. integrating those players into the rock stuff we were doing. Mm-hmm. And so at our church, you know, I had had the St. Louis Symphony out several times for big Christmas events and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, doing that sort of thing. So, you know, I definitely had kind of a big scope in my mind Did for, yeah. yeah. And, and it very much kind of like a rock background, but you know, rock blended with the orchestral thing has always kind of been my MO. <clears throat> I've recently been um, kind of semi-employed by a by a local studio to help with arrangements for, uh-huh. for original artists. Um, okay. And, and there's a, I've done a little bit with a, with a few different people and I've, I'm kind of finding myself kind of thinking to myself, how, how do I bring this tune to life? Uh, yeah. Like what? Like some of the chord progressions are quite basic. So, but I don't want to take away from that too much. You know, where right. where can I slide in a nice a nice chord substitution that will complement the, the the melody yeah. and, and the feel of the song? Sure. And then it's right. kind of like I, I often find myself going to something somebody else has done and kind of nicking a little bit from there and and kind of putting things mm-hmm. together. So it was just yeah. to know whether that was something that you you did, like whether you were influenced by anybody else at the time. Um, well, I, I would say, I mean, in reference to what you're doing right now, it's a little bit of a tricky time. So in, in those early kind of Ron Canoli era integrity albums, oh. that was very much a time when uh, it, it was the, the flavor of the month thing to do was to explore richer and richer and richer harmony. Yeah. Now, just just as the the waves of musical taste go, mm. uh, you know, it, it's sort of the other side of that wave now. Totally. I was going to come to that later. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Ahead. So I mean, if, if if you're arranging like younger indie artists, mm. it's almost like your your tendency as an arranger uh, can actually go counter to the mm. song. Mm. Uh, so it, it's almost like you, you need to. Um, I mean, assuming that's the kind of music it is, if it's more indie artists, you know, mm. maybe you need to fish in a different pool yeah. other than make the chord progression richer. You know, maybe you need to look at texture or unique instruments mm. because it, it's, I mean, to me, this this whole thing is very much kind of like waves of musical taste. It very you much know, so. God, yeah. God hasn't changed a bit, but, mm. you know, we're, we're at a point where... Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say we're almost at the bottom of the musical interest Absolutely, uh, yeah. wave. Yeah. So, but what that means is, like, the interest is more in uh, unique sounds, unique textures, unique mm. instruments. 
Um, and it's almost like the farther you can push that envelope, you're much more likely to uh, come up with something that uh, will, will feel more like the flavor of the month in terms of arranging goes. It's almost a little bit of an anti-art arranging period right now. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like you get a pretty steady diet of, you know, one, six, four, five, yeah. which has been the staple for 300 years, really, when you think yeah. about it. Hmm. Um, but even in like a Hillsong song, when you hear like a two chord, it's like, whoa. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> the impact that that has now. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of a big deal. So hmm. it, it's almost like you have to scale down your musical knowledge mm. from a harmonic standpoint mm. uh i mean i mean depending so i'm i'm assuming that what you're working on would be kind of young indie here's my four yeah. chord song people yeah kind of that kind of thing i mean there's there's been a range of different things all over the last few months that have come in like the most recent one is very much more like a folky time type of thing so that's a little bit easier to because i'm not really yeah. worrying about the harmonies um, it's kind of like what what can we do to to bring the guitar and the vocal to life? You know, can we add a little cello in or a little a little light light rhythm or I don't know whatever. It, no, it, it, exactly. I, I think you have to almost like set aside your harmonic arranger thing, mm. Mm. which is hard to do. I mean, it's hard for me to do, but yeah, because that's when the thing right that floats thing. my boat, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, kind of the same for me. But uh, so, like you say, maybe you need to think. Okay, guitar. You know, what if we double the guitar with like mandolin, mm. or, or you know, what's what's a different way to look at guitar, or maybe even just a different way to to mic it to make it sound different, or or, or maybe like super raw, super simple is the right thing for this yeah. artist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or just like capoing it up and mm. you know, doing it in a way that is mm. is different. So yeah, it's almost like of all the different pools that an arranger can fish in, mm. uh, you, you really have to be doing the right kind of album to go mm. to that rich harmony pool. Yeah, just just because, and and it's really not a matter of. I mean, God loves it all, mm. but right at the moment, I mean, I'm convinced that that wave is going to come back. I, I think I think you have to speak the language. That the people are going to receive. So if if you know, like if there's no point in going to France and speaking Korean there, you know, it's just not going to work. If you're if you're working with a younger kind of indie crowd, uh, there's no point in speaking the language of, of that rich harmony. Um, now you know it could be the reverse. You know, if if you're uh, if you are speaking to you know more of an audience that really wants to hear kind of a richer palette. You know they're gonna they're gonna tire pretty soon of the you know the basic one six four five thing. I actually uh, just saw a renewal this morning. Uh, I, I actually have uh, a website which I've never done anything with, which is one six four five worship. Okay. <laughs> uh, just just sort of occurred to me one day talking to Paul Balash actually joking around and uh, I, I just I grabbed it. But it's kind of where things are now. It is yeah. And, uh, but I, I just think the challenge for an arranger is, uh, okay, I could totally fish in that pond, but I'm going to force myself to fish into some different mm. uh, ponds, you know, mm. so different instruments. And, and sometimes just it, it's really hard to say as an arranger, I'm going to really let this be simple and raw. Mm. You know, uh, a lot of times the most effective arrangement I mean, even in terms of intros and in hmm. most stuff these days is just kind of like, yeah, we're done. Cut the tape. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. So it, it's very much kind of an anti-art thing, you know, mm. Where, whereas, you know, the just like, you know, the coolest jeans are the ones with the most holes in them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. So when I say anti-art, I mean... Uh, you know, you the sort of the it thing now is less sophisticated. Um, now, having said that, I mean, I've been doing a lot of kind of like string and orchestral stuff, oddly enough, and this is really odd, uh, in the in the kind of hip hop R&B 
world. Okay, right, okay. Which, so, so they're, they're kind of coming out the other side of the wave where, um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I literally, I don't know if you know who Chance the Rapper is. No, I, I, I but, might have uh, heard the name actually, yeah. He, he is, uh, he's like the new It guy. Right. And uh, we, 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 played, <laughs> we, we played the Grammy broadcast with him last year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, literally he and his guys are coming over looking at the music on the cello stand going, Oh my gosh! You guys like you read you read this and it, that tells you. So for them, for that universe, it, it's it's like a completely oh my gosh yeah. novel thing. Yeah. And uh, and, and he, he's actually uh, well, let's put it this way: I, he, he's a believer in the broadest sense of the word. Yeah. Probably maybe a little bit too colorful for the average church maybe still but super so i mean in other words we did chris tolan's how great is our god Mm, yeah on the grammys with a full orchestra and a huge black choir Mm. and kirk franklin and you know i mean and he was just preaching Mm. jesus so uh now mixed with some colorful language and Mm. some other stuff you know but uh so that whole kind of arranging thing is becoming popular mm. in in that universe. So Definitely. I, I, I think it'll I think it'll be back. Let's put it that way. It's strange because I went. I've been to see Snarky Puppy in this country probably three times now, <laughs> and I I was astonished at the the age group that were there. Like I was expecting people maybe my age upwards. Um, yeah. But the average age of the audience was probably early twenties, and I was like, wow, the young people are hungry for this stuff yep yeah you know yeah so so th- that event we're talking about so Corey henry is going to be one of the clinic guys at that uh, oh wow <laughs> that worldwide worship event and and he's a believer you know yeah. he's Incredible. very much right on guy mm. but uh yeah and, and i sort of feel the same way so you know we're, we're maybe in the way you know we're, yeah. we're maybe just kind of crawling up yeah the the other side where mm. you know the skills that you have uh, are all of a sudden going to start to be very unique and and sought after. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe with some of those indie guys, you know, you, you might you might look at, uh, you know, not so much orchestral, but what would they think about, you know, just like a raw string quartet behind mm-hmm. that simple acoustic guitar? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be rich, charming, but just like, you know, amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I you like know, it. That kind of, we, we did a thing for uh, for Saturday Night Live. That this hip hop girl that uh, was, you know, they they had requested a very sort of odd orchestration, mm. just like super simple, like cello, flugelhorn, clarinet, and something else. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's a weird assignment. Mm. But you know, you listen to it in the context of that thing, and that piece was really unique and really, yeah. uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I think, I, I think it might be coming. So may, maybe try to push those arrangements just from an instrumentation standpoint, yeah. not necessarily a harmony standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good point. I'm probably going to jump around a little bit now. Um, just yeah, yeah, so go I can for fit, it. fit a few things in going back to currency, yeah, current things. It's like the electric piano sound that you used on those, um, Hosanna recordings. I love right that sound, but like today it would be classed as like seriously. I don't know if you have this word in in America, but we would call it corny, you know, like cheesy. Yeah. But I love it. Yeah. Like it, the the sound is so rich, and like you can play one chord with that sound, and and to me it sounds like worship. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of what do you use these days? You tend to just use a flat Rhodes or a a flat acoustic piano. Do you ever dabble with the the JD eight hundred. Yeah, well, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it it's it's just like fashion. I mean, yeah. any anything that becomes really really big and iconic, yeah. it's going to do its peak. And then, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've got a lot of great sax playing friends. And there was a time when every pop song had to have a sax solo. Yeah. And then there's a period when, oh my God, sax solo would be the kiss of death mm. for a pop song. Yeah. But you know, it, it's it's sort of coming back around, mm. you know, where where that's getting ready to be hip again. Mm. But uh, it's the same thing for a sound like that. Mm. Uh, right now, 
I wouldn't use that song unless no. I was doing a Ron Canoli thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but a great sounding acoustic piano has never gone out of style. No. no. Um, and, and like you say, if I'm going to use an electric piano, it's going to be like a super flat uh, Rhodes or yeah. Whirly, mm -hmm. but but not the rich rich kind of combined sound that we used to use. No. Um, but yeah, usually keyboard wise, I mean, I just we were just working on an album for Alan Park this last week. Wow. And my uh, uh, my you know this this thing that I set up for him was a great grand piano of not not flat roads but an unaffected roads unaffected whirly hmm. and those are the only pianos and the rest of the stuff are definitely more kind of uh synth based things yeah uh several different kind of bpm time echo type things yeah yeah arpeggiators um, kind of thing yeah arpeggiator yeah. things do you know uh, Do you know Omnisphere at all? Yes, I do, yeah. I was going to get onto that because some of the soft synths these days are just incredible. Fabulous, yeah. yeah. If, do you own Omnisphere? I do, yeah. Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, rather than have 25 different soft synths, uh, I was just with Eric at the uh, the NAMM show. And again, that whole company are believers. Really? Uh, yeah. Eric, uh, Eric was the programmer for Roland for all those years. So his whole background is all that early Roland stuff, and then yeah. he left to, to do uh, Spectrosonics. Yeah. But uh, uh, Omnisphere has some phenomenal, uh, very forward-thinking keyboard, yeah. as well as some retro stuff. But mm. uh, yeah, I mean, I find, I mean, basically all I took up to Alan's place was uh, I've been using, uh, so I, I play keys for him yeah. in his band, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I just put a bunch of sounds in the chord Kronos. Oh yeah, you know that. Okay, keyboard? yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just went there with the Kronos and Omnisphere, mm -hmm. and it's it's everything you'd ever need, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, if if you have, if you haven't really mined uh, Omnisphere, that that's that's a great place uh, source of inspiration for me uh, yeah so, so what what is your primary keyboard um my my keyboard is a roland rd 300 sx uh, but i only use okay. it as a midi controller because right. i'm able to get sound i mean to be honest i'm using the, my ipad a lot more now for sounds like i got um, uh -huh. the gospel musicians mk sensation for the mks 20 um yeah. and then i've got a, a an app called bs 16i which you're able to load in um, WAV samples from other instruments for my for my own purposes so that I can play them from the iPad so that when I go to church I, I, I can um, I can plug the USB into my iPad and then take the the, uh, the <laughs> mini jack out and I've got all the sounds on my iPad so I'm not taking my laptop which isn't particularly well powered um, so right. so I tend to work off soft synths all the time and, and it, it's it's incredible the the yeah. range of sounds that's available from from an right. iPad, you know, I, I've got sounds that I would need to have had a rack of modules and and about three different sure. keyboards to get the sound in, yeah. like, like you do. Couple of refrigerator racks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, way, and and I've, I've I've kind yeah. of half perfected the uh, the sound that you had with, I've got the LA gra LA midi grand sound from the from the JD eight hundred, um, yeah. with the crystal, <laughs> crystal roads. And then I, and I and I could hear something else who was in the background, and I don't know whether I'm right here, but I, I think it's the um, is the ice ring from the TG seventy sevens. Every now and then I can hear that patch. Um, I, I did that a lot, yeah. Yeah, oh. and, and and that was a question I was going to ask. Did you ever change the levels of each of them to, um, to suit the song, or was it like a flat? You just said it at the beginning of the concert, and yeah, I mean, I I always uh, well, you know, the live. Wow, um, I did have all that stuff separate live. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I I would move around. I mean, that that in my thinking, that was just a way to help the arrangement grow. So, mm. and I would usually have a pad sound mixed in with that as well. So, mm. so you could always go down to just a pad if you wanted it. Yeah. If you want to start with just the grand and then add mm. the crystal rose over the top later. Mm. So you know, these days you can easily do that with the faders on your yeah. controller. Mm -hmm. I think uh, 
<laughs> yeah, even back then, you know, I, I had a, a KX88 that had four faders, and, and that seems like that's usually the way I would set it. But if I was in the studio, I'd probably track all those separately anyway on all separate right, track. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you could automate those changes, mm -hmm. uh, just mute things where you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, uh, I, I always print stuff to audio mm -hmm. uh, just so... You know, if, if you're sending session copy out and somebody doesn't have the soft synth you used or you find yourself in a location, yeah. I always end up printing that stuff. I even print the click right, so okay. that mm. it's it's all available as WAV mm. files. Okay. And the other thing I was going to say as an arranger, uh, a lot of times, you, you kind of touched on this in the beginning, but it always seems to me to be a little bit better to do your arranging almost like away from your instrument because I think you, I think your mind is freer to just imagine what you hear. Yeah. When like like you know when your fingers are actually on the keys, there's a certain amount of muscle memory that takes over. Yeah. Mm. And and you're just thinking more in terms of do I like this sound or I not like this sound versus mm. if you're just out for a drive in the country and you're listening to this demo, mm. and then you sort of like stop, and just just sort of imagine. I, I think, you know, and, and just bringing in the spiritual side, I think your mind is just more open for God to kind of put ideas in mm. and, and just really let you dream about something that you'd never really find under your hands mm. or you'd never necessarily find if you're just kind of going through patches. Yeah. Uh, and then once you hear that and you kind of get this thing in your imagination, then go find, well, how do I get that sound? Mm hmm you know what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes I think that is a little bit more free thinking. Uh, if you've done a bunch of different artists and you're just trying to say, gosh, I need to get out of this groove and, and, and find a new place. Sometimes I would try to do it with no instrument around. Okay. No, that's interesting. Just, that's helpful. Just use your imagination. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you came up with certain arrangements, like let's take God is able album for example so when you came up with those arrangements did you record the arrangement in in like a midi format so that you had something set in stone and then you kind of went away and then notated it for the musicians to play or did the musicians hear the idea that you had from a midi file or how, how did that work when yeah it came to i mean just just the way so we've been discussing this a lot because uh uh i mean obviously i have a ton of respect for alan yeah but uh uh you know, his approach is very different from mine. So mine is exactly what you described. You know, I would I would try to go away. I mean, I, I like driving, you know, and, and even the part of the world that you're in, you know, is a great place to just get away and, mm. and drive and, and just think and conceive. And and you know, have a have a playlist of, you know, your twenty five songs that impact you, mm. you know. So listen to the demo, listen to some music that you completely love yourself. Mm you know, back and forth like that and try to conceive it there. But then I would go back to the studio with those thoughts mm -hmm. and conceive uh, the arrangement. And, and literally, I mean, like this thing, I'm, uh, I'm doing a piece with Alan uh, that is full rhythm section, but it's a full orchestra. It's actually a prog rock version of a classical mm -hmm. piece. But the thing I'm telling him is, you know, he's basically letting me do it, and I would MIDI sketch the complete thing. Okay, yeah. Uh, all the tempos, for me, I'd probably do do it on piano first, then I would MIDI do the orchestration, so that literally I can listen to a pretty close mock-up of what it'll be yeah. and decide, eh, I don't know, I'm, am I getting a little bored here? You know, maybe I need mm -hmm. to trim four bars off the end of this, or... Wow, you know, this could easily build eight more bar. You know, that that kind of thinking. Mm. It, uh, I mean, I, I think about it like this: like if you're doing an old school Disney cartoon, the first thing they'll do is just with just with pencil, they'll sketch out a storyboard, and pretty much pencil sketch the whole cartoon. Mm -hmm. So you could watch the whole cartoon and get an idea of pacing, of intro. Does it take too long to get to the main point? Mm. Gosh, I haven't seen the main character for a while. You know, that kind of thinking. And then once you've got your pencil version all edited, in other words, your MIDI version, mm. then you bring in the color people. So before mm. I, I ever bring a musician in, I kind of know 
you know, and then you just paint the colors within your pencil drawing and maybe yeah. erase the pen. You know? So that's the way I work. Now, a lot of great producers like Alan is much more to bring 10 guys in and let's just see what happens, mm. you know, which, which does get you to a different result. Mm. But, uh, yeah, from an arranger standpoint, it's very much out of control. Yeah. And it's really not as efficient mm. as, you know, uh, once I've got my sketch and I've sent those charts out to the guys ahead of time and they've been listening to that sketch for a week. Right. So by the time they come to record or to a live <laughs> game, like in the case of God is Able, they've already, they've got it. It's not yeah. like you're throwing a chart in front of somebody for the first time. Yeah, awesome. How about guitar parts? Because obviously um, it's very difficult to find a guitarist who, especially, well, I say I should say it's difficult. It's difficult round round here, should I say, to find a guitarist who's capable of of playing voicings that match, say, the top note on your keyboard part. Uh -huh. how, did, how did you go about that? Did you write out what you wanted as the top part for, say, Danny Bridgens, um, what you wanted as the top note, or did he work it out himself? based on your yeah rhythm. now yeah when it comes to like um yeah so the rhythm section guys i i, I definitely am hiring people that i, I want their input right so yeah I, I i may sketch out a part on a keyboard uh but i would always say like to paul or danny or abraham mm -hmm. or any of these guys you know i mean this this is my first take but obviously the reason i'm bringing you in is because i want you to take this concept mm -hmm and come up with something absolutely brilliant, mm. you know? So, yeah, in that sense, I'm not really sketching out that degree of detail. Okay. Now, I may have something in my mind, mm. but my, my whole approach as an arranger producer is, <coughs> uh, I always think an idea is better if the artist I'm producing comes up with it. Mm. Now, I might kind of nudge them in the direction I know I wanted to go, but uh, a singer or a player is much more likely to really be heart invested in a part mm. if they feel like it's their part, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's not that's not being manipulative. No. Uh, you know, I just want I just want to get people in a zone where they're really inspired to create. Mm -hmm. So if if you tell somebody this is what I want you to do, you know, a, a, a veteran studio guy will do a good job with that, but it's not quite as much like, wow, Paul, you know, you know, I love everything you do. This is my concept, but I, I really want you to to be mm. Paul Jackson, you know. Yeah. So that 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 puts them in much more of a highly motivated mm. place to to come up with something great, you know. Yeah. And and I've I've done a million albums, so I don't necessarily always want to do my idea, you know. I yeah, mean, I, so. I want somebody to come along and, you know, let's take it a different direction from the way I was going to take it. Mm. Mm. Like do it. Do you use a lot of the same guys? In, in your <laughs> yeah, we tend to use a, a core group of, of guys at the studio. Um, uh -huh. I mean, obviously, it's not LA, <laughs> uh, but yeah. you know, uh, you know, each musician brings their own background and their own style. Um, right. I mean, I'm 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 quite old school in terms of of the way I hear things, I suppose, um, and I'm probably still mm -hmm. every time I hear something, I'm still. I hear things that are ninety pre nineteen nineties, shall we say nineteen nineties and, yeah. and and back and backwards. Like I'm very much a jazz, funk, soul, gospel right. kind of guy. That's that's my my thing. But then I I realise yeah. that I can't let that influence the song, shall we say. Um, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, to get back to the point, sorry, we um, we do have kind of a, a core group of guys that we that we use. And um, well, I mean, I I would say when I'm arranging uh, of the you know so basically. You know, you're covering keyboards. You're thinking in terms of, you know, is it cello? Am I bringing in, you know, this whole big range? But yeah. basically, you know, you're talking drums, bass, guitar. Yeah. You're the keyboard side, and then there's this other world. To me, uh, the guitar guy is the guy I'm really honed in on mm. because that's like a universe that that I really want an expert. Now, I've got great guitar samples just like you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's a whole universe of sounds there. Yeah, you can't that, replicate it. Yeah. Now, now, when it comes to drums and bass, you know, mm. in, in pop music these days, you and I can pretty much 
hit that. Now, obviously, you know, you want a creative drummer. You want a creative bass guy to bring mm. life in. But, you know, my my investment is way more in the guitar guy in terms mm. of, uh, I mean, it's almost like for sure after the initial track, I'm probably bringing the guitar guy back. Mm. I don't really need to bring the bass or the drums back. So when I'm tracking, I'm really looking for, really what I'm looking for is a great take of the drums. Mm -hmm. Tom Phil Choice, this is what I want. Awesome. Go hang out. I'll fix a few notes of the bass. Mm -hmm. Be sure the bass track is killer. Mm -hmm. I'm almost not so much worried about the guitar guy because I know I'm going to bring him back, mm -hmm. and we're going to noodle. Now we might take his part from that cutting date and go. We can totally use that. Or gosh, this is the idea that made the thing rock. We mm -hmm. could probably, you know, we we could get that a little better now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying though? But yeah. but I'm I'm really kind of building it from the ground up. But I know for sure. I want some time with that guitar guy mm -hmm. to really explore, layer, let's get the sound right. You know, obviously you were jumping to your chorus sound for the verse sound, but I kind of want those to dovetail. Yeah. All, all that type of stuff, I, I would definitely allow time to, to, you know, create with the guitar guy for sure. Yeah, the guitar is certainly a key instrument, especially when it comes to, um, like, the style <coughs> we're talking about. I mean, when you remove that guitar with, the like, the muted... Um, 16th or syncopated lines it adds so much when it's there you know and yeah. and, and it's a, that's an art in itself just that that rhythmic yeah. feel and, and not a guitarist not feeling the need to play all six strings all the time I yeah. mean that that's yeah. where the money is <laughs> absolutely no you're totally right and and to me the only way to really get that right is just you and him because mm. obviously when he's playing with the drummer if they're there in the room He's probably catching all kind of lower strings just mm. out of excitement, you know. Mm. And uh, you know he's probably switching sounds, you know, mm. uh, live. Mm. So to come back and say that's what I wanted to do live mm. uh, on the live pass, but then it come back and go, wow, you know, you laid down a great smorgasbord. Now let's go back and let's completely perfect that, mm. you know, nuance it, and uh, and not even forgetting about the whole acoustic side, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, guitars, high-strung guitars, capoed guitars, you know, yeah. mandolin, yeah. Uh, all kinds of different stuff like that. There, there's a lot of fun colors to play with, for sure. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. <coughs> what was my next question going to be? Maybe moving on slightly to, to keep keyboard playing. I've, yeah, kind of, yeah. I've, um, I've kind of been picking apart the um, You're My Everything song from God is Able um, I'm okay. kind of like trying to learn your part verbatim shall we say because I, I got a copy of the tracks the tracks album when you learn it you can remind me of it because <laughs> <laughs> I mean seriously there's some outstanding both sorry two songs I'm learning You're My Everything and, Re and Resounding Praise because those two songs uh -huh. just, I don't know they hit me they hit me here <laughs> and um, like harmonically there's, there's a lot going on in there and uh -huh. um and I'm wondering, in terms of how you think when you're playing those chords, like there's there's a there's a chord in uh, "You're My Everything." I think it's the, it's in the uh, the verse part, and it's a uh, I think it's a B flat, altered seven. And um, mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm playing that, I, when when I play the voice in that you're playing, I, I, I've got like a D, an F sharp. Let me think: a D, an F sharp, a G sharp. A, a B and a C sharp or something in my right hand. So I, I'm kind of looking at it like, oh, well, that's a, a D major seven with a flat five and a sharp five over a B flat. I was just wondering if, if you think like that yeah. when you're playing altered chords, do you think yeah. like polychords? Well, uh, here's here's my my take on all of those those upper tonality chords. Um, and I, I think that my take is probably a bit different Okay. from some people, but, but I think my approach is like way easier to understand. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, so I teach at a university, mm -hmm. and when I teach this type of stuff in theory, um, I think in terms of, uh, like, like jazz guys would talk about a shell voicing. Okay. So uh, for this, this whole group of chords, if you're doing any kind of like Israel Houghton or mm. gospel, gospel jazz, whatever, um, I just think of the left hand as being the root and a dominant seventh, because all these chords are really variations of dominant seventh. Yeah. Based. Yeah, with altered notes. And, and it's almost like uh, I'm going to try to see if I can. Uh, uh, 
know if this is going to work or not. But um, uh, so so that chord is probably a B flat root, right? Yeah, B flat root. Yeah. So so with that, uh, I, I think of all of these as uh, the, now these are the primary ones, the ones you run into a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, is different triads over that. And there's a great uh, there's a great Stevie Wonder song that uh, I know in the back of his mind he was thinking of this because it literally is just a chromatic collection of how many different triads can you play over that shell and come up with another usable upper tonality chord. <laughs> so uh, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the song, but it, it goes something like a, uh, like a Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah, it does, but I can't think of the name of the song. Yeah, I, I can't think of it either. But <laughs> but anyway, like you see what I'm doing? Every single one of those triads, uh, I literally just came in from that album. I don't even have my pedal yeah. hooked up here yet. But, uh, uh, so obviously that's your basic 11 chord, right? Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. uh, A-flat triad. A-flat over, over B-flat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the next down, so a G major triad... Mm-hmm. So if you look, so your brain here is like definite G major, but with this below it, mm. you've got the third, which the third, of course, would be in that dominant. Yeah. Thirteen, and then that guy is a flat nine. Okay. So that's right. basically B flat thirteen flat nine, but rather than you know that's kind of an obtuse. Yeah. I, so it's almost it's almost like an English American dictionary, right? Yeah, yeah. We're speaking the same language, but to me, G over the shell is a much easier way for my brain to think about it. That helps rather me than, hugely. That helps me yeah. massively. Yeah. Now, now, just just keep going down those triads. Okay. There's. I'm. I'm just going down triads by half steps, right? Mm-hmm. So F sharp over that shell. Now, in this case, I would probably put the third. In there as well because there's your sharp nine. Yeah. Right. So shell, sharp nine, mm-hmm. flat thirteen, and then just the B flat is B flat. So mm-hmm. uh, the F sharp over the shell is B flat, sharp nine, flat thirteen, or <laughs> sharp nine, sharp five. Right. Yeah. Same. Same thing. Yeah. But you're not thinking of any of that, really, are you? All those yeah, I, I'm just I'm just thinking of so it's almost like a slash chord mm. uh, in in my mind. Yeah, and uh, you know, like another one would be uh, th- this one's not quite so common. Um, like E over B flat, mm-hmm. you've got uh, flat nine and flat five. That's another pretty common one. Mm. But again, that's really just an E triad over it right yeah yeah sure so all all of those all those shell voicings uh you know it's like a dominant seven shell and then all of those chords that you're talking about are just uh, a collection of triads Uh and that stevie wonder song i like because it it literally he walks through every single possible triad some of which are like way outside but just because it's in this chromatic move it's like it was okay you know, but then you do land on some of those ones that are in that same song there, and uh, but but to me it's way simpler to think about it like a polychord triad. Or, yeah. Now now they they don't always fall into triads, but a lot of them do fall nicely mm. into triads. Yeah. And then with your right hand, if you're improvising, if you're thinking more in terms of that triad rather than a B flat chord, if you're thinking G triad. Uh, yeah, uh, you're outlining. The, then, the, like the all of a sudden, your 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 brain is on a simple G triad, but you're <coughs> you're r- rushing across all these hot notes. Yeah, in terms of r- their relationship to the bass, uh-huh. so it's way easier to think about that way. That's that's great because because I yeah. kind of wrestled with that. I wasn't sure whether I was oversimplifying things in terms of like I realized quite quickly on that there were some chords where you would play. I don't like a, a C diminished in the right hand and a and a D in the in the left hand you were getting that seven flat nine um, right so 
<clears throat> and I was thinking, am, am I allowed to think like this? Because <laughs> it seemed yeah. too easy to. I, I think it's much easier, and uh, you know, like you know, when you're having a conversation like this with a guy like Paul Jackson, who's very much in the jazz school, mm. that that's they're 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 thinking that way. Mm. You know, they're they're thinking the upper tonality stuff, and it's the same way. Even so, that's like the whole school of dominant seven yeah. chords, basically. Mm. But I mean, it's all these polychords are the same. So even if you're like on a on a D minor chord. Mm. So your shell is like the root third fifth of the D minor. Mm. Once you start getting into these upper tonality parts of the structure, mm. you know it's really almost like a C triad mm. over that D minor shell. Yeah. So. Yeah, with E nine eleven and. Yeah. So it could be D minor eleven. But in your brain, if you're thinking C up on the top. It's just much easier to improvise, and, and your improvisations are dusting over all these hot notes much easier. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I very much think. I mean, some people would say, you know, you can call it a polychord, you can call it a sort of a slash chord, mm. but I, I think it's a much easier to. And, and as a as a professor, it's a much easier way to explain it. Yeah. You know, because people start to get glazed over when you start talking about flat thirteen sharp nine. Yeah. You know, they're going. Where does it end? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. But I mean, ultimately, it's it's really just the same twelve notes. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it shouldn't be uh, all yeah. that scary. We make it quite complicated <laughs> when. Well, I mean, I, I yeah. have in the past, but there's only twelve notes, and it's like, see, yeah. I don't know. We I think we 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 tend to hear something and think that it's really complicated but when you actually sit down and work it out it's like the light bulb goes on and like like what's yeah. happened to me with god is able you know going through all yeah. that stuff and listening to it and and thinking wow that's that's got to be so difficult to play i'm not saying it's not difficult but when you actually work it out it's like actually i can see what's going on <laughs> yeah or, or, or if you're uh, the edge with you too uh, i remember one of his grammy acceptance speeches kind of like i don't know what the big deal is it's only eight notes <laughs> yeah. but, which in their case is probably true mm, but yeah. uh yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if he was saying that tongue-in-cheek or if, if he actually uh, <laughs> meant, meant to say that yeah, but, yeah and, and even listening to like you're listening to a snarky puppy mm. arrangement it, it's good to go back and remind yourself he, he's using the same 12 notes that mm. i have right under my hands mm. you know totally so uh yeah mm. it, it it, it does help your analysis to know that there is an end to this. Yeah, it's not like it, you know, doesn't go on forever. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll. Uh, I know we've only got five minutes left, so I'll. I'll just quickly ask a couple more questions, and I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, go, go for it. Um, <clears throat> prior to using the the JD eight hundred, because obviously that came out in ninety one, and I was just wondering what what keyboards you used prior prior to that, like for for um, Amazing Love and Eternal God, because I think that was. That 1990. I can't remember. I'm just wondering what keyboard you used prior to that. Yeah, that's interesting. The 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 JD came out in '91, did it? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So oh, unless you okay. got a, unless you got a copy sooner. <laughs> I I would I would have guessed earlier, but uh, I mean my uh, so I've had a mini Moog forever okay. since they first came out in '72. Um, way early on, so uh, you know the whole. DX7 happened, mm -hmm. and uh, I got there, there was modules called TX802, okay, 816. Yeah. So basically, you you got like eight DX7s layered on top. Right, okay, of each other. yeah. So so that would that would have been probably my earliest poly, yeah, FM kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. Uh, Prophet Five mm -hmm. would would have been back early on. Mm. Uh, I did have a Dino Rhodes, but okay. you know you didn't you didn't have any mini, MIDI capability cool. there. Mm. But 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 that's kind of uh, th those would have been the keyboards prior to the JD. Yeah, I might have had I might have had some Roland modules before mm. that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know the sequence. But but for a lot of that period, uh, the Korg Wave Station is one that I liked a lot. Okay. Mm. Uh, the uh, and the the Yamaha seventy <coughs> what was it? Uh, it I, I had a mod seventy seven was it? Yeah, I had yeah. a module of that which was yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah, um, and I had like an S one thousand sampler, but okay, uh, like that. 
Yeah. But it's funny. So Eric, the guy that designed all those early Roland things, mm-hmm. he's Spectrosonics, mm-hmm. which I still love Omnisphere a lot. Yeah. Uh, the guy that designed all the Korg stuff is a guy named Jack Hotop. Right. Okay. Who, who has become a friend of late, uh, and he designed for everybody. So like, you know, he's just he's a veteran guy. So he's hanging out with Keith Emerson, Rick Wake, Steve oh, wow. Wonder, all these yeah. ridiculous guys. Um, but but he he is uh, still the head designer for Korg, so uh, all all those guys are are pretty. I mean they're still doing amazing stuff. Mm. I mean for me, the Omnisphere and this Korg Chronos are oh, it's the pinnacle, isn't it, right now? Yeah, pretty much mm. all all I need. Yeah, my um my my dad, who's a huge fan of yourself, um, he, he I don't know. He searched for so long to find out what that sound was, and like he, he was he was convinced it was a DX7, and and I don't yeah. know, we, we could never quite get it until a long time later when we realised what it was. Um, yeah. And I've I've only just got to the point now where with the soft synths I can say to my my dad, here you go, here's the sound you've been looking for all your life. <laughs> yeah, so, no, um, you're totally right. You probably find it on a soft synth. Mm. Uh, on, yeah, on absolutely. Um, but but I, th- I think as an arranger, I mean, the, the thing I would challenge you to do is just, like, find find some sounds to, uh, I mean, just, just kind of yank yourself out of that world, at, at least for that initial stage. Yeah. And just sort of imagine some elements that mm. you bring in from someplace other than the keyboard universe. Mm. Especially if, I mean, I'm imagining, but especially if it's kind of younger indie organic yeah. kind of people mm-hmm. try to come up with some you know kind of more organic natural yeah sounds mm-hmm. and, and maybe some unique players that play those sounds you know mm-hmm. hammer dulcimer or uh you know mm-hmm. some of these instruments that are just kind of way off the beaten path mm-hmm. uh, and even if you're imagining that and you don't have a player but then you go into omnisphere and it's like search for dulcimer and it's like oh wow yeah. You know? <laughs> and and oh by the way I can actually get that part exactly how I want it you know mm. maybe you'd have a hard time finding a player but you know yeah. what I'm saying just, just kind of make yourself fish in some fresh places yeah. and see what you come up with yeah awesome I, I really appreciate that that's a, uh, that's a, a really valid point um, and it's something to think about um, my very last question, and then I'll let you go because I know you're a busy man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just wondering who your your major musical influences have, have been through the years. Like, who who are the guys that you enjoyed listening to up until yeah. now? You know, who? Yeah, I mean, I would say like way back in the growing up, probably Keith Emerson. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're all Brits. <laughs> yeah. Keith Emerson. Uh, yes, Genesis for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I met Chester just kind of through yeah. love of Genesis. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, probably those bands were, mm-hmm. were my initial, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of learned how to write for brass from Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. Okay, you yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, orchestra-wise, uh, my, my whole college experience was like Stravinsky, Debussy, Ravel. Mm-hmm. So it was mostly all in that late 1800s, early 1900s kind of period, which mm. was just an awesome period for orchestra. And uh, and some of those <laughs> guys really understood, like like when you listen to Stravinsky and stuff like that, mm. it's it's rock and roll using orchestral instruments. I mean, just like the aggression and the power. Mm. Uh, so to me, and, and again, and kind of growing up on, on Alan Parsons' project yeah. music, uh, he, he's influenced so many people. Yeah, the idea of blending rock <laughs> with excuse me mm. was very much kind of my mo from the very beginning, mm. and and just on those earlier Integrity albums, you mm. know, having already worked with the St. Louis Symphony and having brought them into my church for events, yeah, that was just a natural thing mm. for me. So, uh, you know, going out and meeting, uh, you know, we were super young. We we, we met Jack Hayford. I don't know okay, yeah, is. yeah, from the church on the way. Yeah, Church on the Way, who was a pastor who really got worship. Mm. And uh, this is all right at the same time that we had been producing those albums. Mm. Uh, when he debuted his song, Majesty, mm. we went out to California. He debuted it at, a, at an event there. Uh, I went down, I, I was probably 21 years old or something, you know, went down to the front after it's over 
just, you know, wow, you know, not to sound like a fan, but, you know, mm. this was super amazing. Mm. So the first thing that happened is there's gobos up around the orchestra pretty high. And, uh, you know, I'm right there by the gobo. So I kind of poke my head over and Abel Boreal pokes his head over at the same time from the other side. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. So that was my introduction to Abe. Incredible. And just like, you know, hey, you're obviously busy. You got a lot of people wanting to talk to you, but mm. you know th this was just amazing tonight. Mm. He probably sat there and talked to me for 45 minutes, mm. and mm. I just said, you know, I've, I brought my pastor out here to this event. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to even ask, but do you think there's any way? And he said, Wait a second. Brought Jack Hayford over, uh, and and Jack said, you know, why don't you come into my office tomorrow morning? So, you know, just that whole experience. So we went back. And that's when Integrity had asked me, you know, could you make a new one? So the new one that we made started off with the song Majesty. Yeah. Full on orchestra mm. deal. Uh, Michael Amardian was playing that night. Okay, so right, yeah. I met him that night. So, you know, that, that was pretty much a God ordained, you've got mm. to be kidding me kind of, uh, mm. kind of weekend. Uh, you know, so I mean, I've been playing with Abe ever since then. Yeah. Uh, Jack Jack Hayford is definitely going to be one of the guys that we have come to speak at this event that yeah, we're awesome. planning. Awesome. I mean, I, I feel like he's he's one of those like a pastor guy who mm. really knows how to say something about worship. Mm. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So those guys would have been all kind of big influences for sure. Mm. Uh, keyboard wise, I'd say Omardian, mm -hmm. uh, David Foster. Okay. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you can't go wrong with Emerson. Mm. You know, he's probably the most brilliant one to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, looking back, an awful lot of, of, of uh, guys from the UK. Mm. Uh, it's bizarre because so. here in the UK, probably it's mostly American guys that, that influence us. <laughs> how, how do they say a prophet is never recognized in his own country? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the one country in the world that we play the least with Alan is England. Yeah. Who Crazy. Knows why? Crazy. Germany all the time, South yeah. America all the time, but yeah. can't get a gig in England, you know. <laughs> yeah. How bizarre. How bizarre, eh? Yeah. I mean yeah. That, that that time period you're talking about, there's no question in my mind that like God really anointed that that time period of, of worship to to the point where it influenced so many lives and it influenced the face of worship in, in church as as we knew it uh, at that time. Yeah. So I mean the I think the ripple from that it, it changed things forever. Yeah. I, I think you know. So, so what is your uh, what what is your church? Uh, are you doing music in church as well as the studio? <laughs> yeah, I'm a church musician. I mean, um, only only in the past twelve months have I moved to keyboards. Prior to that, I was always always just a bit. Well, I say just. <laughs> I mean, a bass player, shall we say? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's a free Methodist church that I'm I'm part of. I don't know if you have. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it is an American denomination, the Free Methodist. Yeah. Yeah. Um but we we tend to sing all the the modern modern worship songs and Yeah. And I have to admit sometimes I have to keep my my own spirit in check because I do get musically bored, should we say. But I have to yeah. I I have to be honest and say, "Lord, help me to to see this from the point of view of serving the people here and not not about that's, gratifying my own tastes and it's difficult, it. but you've got to try yeah. and Keep yeah, it, it is. It, ser serving is the word. Mm. That that's it. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, there's no point in. Yeah, you know, if you're serving food and somebody's allergic to peanuts, even if <laughs> peanut sauce is your main thing yeah. as a chef. Yeah. That you know, there's no point in trying to. Yeah. 